The Robotic Pull Inspection Collar, also known as BRIPC, Group 7. The project objectives. Design and implement a 3D printed collar that will hold together the various subsystems of the collar thoroughly and effectively. Design and implement a climbing and tensioning mechanism. Design and implement a hammer test mechanism. Ensure the microcontroller and all subsystems are operating properly. Design and develop an app to control the Rubik collar. Design and develop a database that will store the results resulting received from the hammer test, time permitting if possible. Here are some of the major accomplishments. We have the collar, the collar design has shifted from a 3D printing to laser cut design and it's ready for production by November 8th. Majority of the hammer test subsystems are functioning. Found and tested methods to measure force from linear actuators to use for automatic adjustments, which measure current to motor, which increase as a force on actuator, as force on actuator increases. Third, fourthly, we built an Android app to control the caller functions through Bluetooth. You do it by linking the app of a database to store hammer test results. Here are our remaining challenges. Firstly, produce and assembling the collar after it's laser cut out of the file sent. Secondly, tensioning the collar to the pole. Thirdly, climbing the pole. Fourthly, fixing minor issues of hammer test subsystem. Fifthly, completing the app. Sixthly, wiring everything together. And finally, testing the final product, the FPL Boca Raton Service Center. Here are some proposed changes. Switching from 3D printed to collar, switching from 3D printed collar to a laser cut collar. Due to the nature of 3D printing large components, we are forced to switch to laser cutting because it's prone to failure and very costly. Many mo modifications have to be made since 5mm plywood has to be bolted together. Another proposed change was task order constantly changing due to frequent delays in regards to 3D printing and laser cutting, mostly due to lack of communication and negligence. Here's the final color design. So on the left you see the 3D model, model showing multiple layers. On the right side uh, showing the outer color with the inner color inside it. Uh, the one after that there's the inner color inside the hollow color and then just basically showing layers in between and teeth. And on the right side you can see basically all of those components broken down to their into drawings that will be sent to get laser cut. And here's my nap chart showing how productive I was during this time, what time I got the work done. Okay, and here we have the most recent aspect I've worked on regarding the tensioning system. So as you can see, as force is being applied to the linear actuator, the amount of current being drawn increases, decreases when that force is removed, and then we see it's increasing again when that force is being reapplied. So we found that this will be a reliable method to get a general idea of the force being applied uh, on the linear actuators so that we can tension them on the utility poles as we require. Uh, so here is the uh, circuit diagram for the linear actuators. So this is similar to what we presented previously with our Raspberry Pi. However, now we're going to be using an Arduino Nano using the three analog read pins and the three current sensor pins on each of the motor driver boards to measure the current coming from the linear actuators to get our uh, approximate of the force that they're applying so that we can uh, design the controller for them. Uh, this is the circuit diagram for the DC motors themselves. This is uh, the same one as we've shown previously, just the Raspberry Pi, each of the three motor driver boards with a motor each attached to them. Uh, up in the top there for both of them is just a simple inclusion of the uh, buck converter that we'll be using to step down the 20 volt drill batteries to 12 volts for our system. Uh, here's the code I've currently been using. On the left is just the general code to control the three motors. Uh, just to confirm that they move in both directions together and then varying speeds if need be. Uh, on the right here is the sample code I've been using to read the current from the motors. Uh, currently, the formula I'm using gives a uh, uh, magnitude less uh, reading than I'm looking for, but even still, uh, given that we know the ratio of 
a motor current to current coming out of the chip uh, from the data sheet, uh, we can still use that as meaningful information to design a controller. Even if we don't have the exact current being drawn, uh, the signal we receive will still be useful for the controller's uh, uh, effect. And then finally, here's just a simple video showing the three motors uh, moving in sync. Uh, one of them is moving in the other direction because I believe it was wired uh, incorrectly. Uh, but we can notice that they move at the same general speed. They change uh, instantly together. So I don't think there's any sort of syncing issue, which is what we were initially worried about when designing this. Uh, and this final slide is just a simple mat chart of the what we've covered so far. So my uh, core remaining tasks are assembling the motor and actuator together, uh, attaching it, and then touching, uh, testing the functionality once it's attached to the collar. Hello, I'm Giancarlo Gomez, and this is the rechargeable battery system. So far, we have a battery percentage reader, which is going to be installed on the outer portion of the collar. That way, the technician can view the battery percentage. We have three DC to DC buck converters that have been adjusted to their proper output voltages. 5 volts for sensor and Raspberry Pi, 12 volt for motors and actuators. Here we have a rechargeable battery and mount. These are the 3D models. At the end of the semester, we plan on making an exploded view of all the components that will be on the collar. The battery subsystem consists of three parts or three steps charging, idle, and discharging. The batteries constantly change changing from fully charged to system in use and not in use. This is the gearbox enclosure which I am also in charge of of the hammer test subsystem. Basically it produces an audible hammer strike but it makes a loud unraveling sound when the wire is unraveling on the pulley. To solve this issue we plan on using a low-pass filter this is a wireless gearbox enclosure it uses its own 12 volt battery source it communicates over Bluetooth with the Raspberry Pi and an Arduino Nano. It's capable of winding up, holding, and releasing the hammer. There's minor issues with the consistency of the results due to the mechanical aspect of the design. Here we can observe the hammers at its wind-up stage. This is the DC motor solenoid connector. Basically these two components allow me to connect the DC motor and the solenoid together. This is the DC motor aligner. This has not been printed yet. Here we can see the DC motor solenoid aligner is inside the aligner. And basically this allows the motor to follow a straight path because an issue I'm currently encountering is that the motor has a gear at the end but that gear is not lining up with the gearbox every single time when the solenoid retracts and extends and this is causing the issue where the hammer is not winding up every single time as it should. Thus by this I can make a path that will always align the gear on the right path. Here's several iterations of pulleys I have used on our gearbox enclosure. The ones with <coughs> struts or stoppers are to form a track for the wire to follow. That way the wire is not all over the place and it's st stuck inside this basically. These are stationary pulleys and are not meant to move and the ones on the right are meant to move and they're the ones that wind up the hammer. The gearbox enclosure consists of two sections. As we can see everything is going to be housed in here. The brackets that are shown on the bottom right are helped assemble it all together at the end as we see here on the right. The gearbox enclosure, this is how it looks when it's mounted on the collar. Here we can observe a bottom view. This is the lid. This is the pin connection of the collar rotation aspect of the hammer test subsystem. It consists of three DC motors that have a gear at the end which turn around the collar is the gearbox and casing pin connection. It has the Arduino Nano with the HCL5 Bluetooth module, a solenoid and a DC motor connected to a motor driver board. 
The gearbox enclosure for Arduino code basically sets up the Arduino Nano to receive input from the Raspberry Pi via Bluetooth. Based on the input received, the gearbox enclosure will either wind up the hammer or release the hammer and stop rotating the motor. This is the gearbox enclosure Raspberry Pi code. Basically, this is the one that sends input to the uh, Arduino Nano. The Raspberry Pi winds up the hammer, then it rotates the collar, then the collar stops rotating, the hammer is released, and then there's a window for the Raspberry Pi to interpret the sound of the strike. And then these results are given in the app. And then this process repeats. This is my demo of the gearbox enclosure with the DC motors that rotate the outer collar. In this demo, you're going to see that the hammer won't wind up due to the fact that I previously mentioned that it's very inconsistent because the motor is not aligning with the gearbox. But right now it should have winded up. It will be holding the hammer and it will be rotating the collar as you can see the three DC motors are moving. Once that stops you can hear the solenoid releases and the hammer would strike. Here we can observe the battery percentage. Here's another demo where we actually hit the hammer. The hammer is striking on a pole at FEU that was provided by FPL. Let me know when you're ready. Okay. As you can see, it was pretty audible and nice for an analysis. We just have to filter out that unraveling sound. Let me know when you're ready. This is a closer look at the part that rotates the outer collar consists of a DC to DC buck converter, a Raspberry Pi 4, two motor driver boards, and three DC motors. You can also see part of the rechargeable battery subsystem where we are displaying the battery percentage. This is a couple pictures of the steps I took to design the gearbox enclosure. First I connected the DC motor with the solenoid using this custom part I made. Then I put the gearbox inside of the gearbox enclosure and attached a couple pulleys. Then I attached the DC motor and the solenoid. Then I placed the mini breadboard with all the wired components. This is another view. And here we can view another view of the pulleys. This is the laser cut lid of the gearbox enclosure. Once it is probably working, it would be uh, screwed in. Here I added a couple wooden walls. That way the wiring doesn't interfere with the moving parts. And here we can observe the different kind of pulleys I've been using to test what works best for this gearbox enclosure. As we mentioned earlier, we have an issue with the unraveling sound. So we need to apply a low pass filter and amplify the audio. Then the microprocessor will interpret the hit using the crest factor. Jose is currently developing a filter in Python for this. This is the sound of an unfiltered hit. This is the sound of a filtered hit. As we can observe, the difference is quite drastic. And we can also see it visually here. This is an unfiltered. The hit and the unraveling look about the same. And then here, the filtered, the hit is amplified. And the unraveling is very small compared to it. We previously determined that a good range for hits is below 18 decibels. And a bad range is above 19 decibels. Thus, based off of this, we put this audio into the MATLAB code we previously used and determined that the crest factor was 19.54, which is a bad hit, 
and it did sound like a bad hit because it was pretty hollow so it confirms that our low pass filter is working this is the Gantt chart of my progress major progress I've made has been mainly towards the gearbox and casing and I look forward to working on attaching the components for the collar and wiring the components as that may be a very time-consuming task that is coming up alright so here's a general flowchart for the mobile app um, when the user opens up the app they can select a Bluetooth device to connect to in this case it'll be the caller obviously um, once they connect they'll tap a button to send a command to the caller the microprocessor will read the command and execute some task accordingly and then it'll send relevant information back to the app such as a uh, hammer test results um, if necessary and then it goes back to uh, the user's control here's a video demonstration of the app functionality all right so here i'll be demonstrating the app for the caller controller so when you open it up you can connect to the raspberry pi and once it connects it brings up a prompt to enter the id of the poll and this will be used later when saving uh, hammer test results to the database. It'll be associated with the poll ID. So I'll just enter some random ID. And from here, you can control it. So if you hit up, um, it displays a message saying LED is turned on. Once we have the collar built, we will start to um, make the, the collar um, turn the wheels to move up when you hit up and down when you hit down. But for now, it's just controlling an LED with the IO pins. And then if you hit the hammer test button, it will receive just an example of test results and then if you go to view results you can see the results of all the tests you did and then if you tap on um, one of the tests it'll say would you like to save this result and you hit ok and it saves it to the database so I can do the same thing with test number two and those will be saved in the database now. And then you can go back and continue controlling it. And that's pretty much it. So since I had more time to work on the app, I decided to implement uh, database functionality. So in this case, I selected Firebase um, their cloud firestore service as the database I have I, I've used this service before so I already have some familiarity with it so um, in the app when a user selects a test result to be saved in the database it's saved instantly as long as the user is um, connected to the internet or has mobile data and the image here shows an example of a entry in the database and i'll talk about the database structure on the next slide so in the database it's organized by the id number of each poll and underneath each ID, you'll have a list of timestamps of when the test was conducted. And then 
inside that will have the actual results of the test. So you'll have the good hits, bad hits, and the overall rating. And then here's my Gantt chart. So pretty much all there's left to do is really to combine the app functionality with subsystems. Once we have the whole caller built, um, we can combine everything together and have it have the app actually control the caller. And then finalize the app functionality and design, um, make sure everything's working properly and everything's set up correctly. And to finalize the app interaction with the caller so that it basically does what it needs to do, we may have to change um, how it controls the caller or receives output from it. And after that, it's just any needed changes that may arise and to prepare deliverables. So what I have been working on for the past couple of days is a filtration system that we're going to be using within our Crest Factor audio code in order to more accurately display our results for the hammer test um, subsystem. So what I currently have in front of me is a audio analysis test that I used um, that I did using uh, Audacity where I tested a low pass filtration system that they currently have on the application. And then I went ahead and I amplified the um, audio sample that I had filtered. So I used a 700 um, Hertz frequency um, cutoff where I used a 45 decibel roll off. This then filtered the entire audio sample, leaving the gear sound very low and the hammer strike not too low, but still low as well. I then amplified the audio sample in order to amplify the hammer strike sound while still keeping the audio sample of the gear noise down. Now this works because since we cut off a majority of the sound of the gearbox um, due to the, uh, the low frequency, the, the hammer strike remains with a very loud sound. So if you watch the demo video, I go more in depth and I share the audio sample and the audio testing. But this is what I use in order to create or to test before I created the current code that I'm going to show you next. So this slide just shows you that um, I was able to create a hammer test um, sound with uh, of the hammer, which is much louder than everything else compared to what we previously had. All this noise was reduced to just the hammer test. So using the idea of the low pass filtering on the whole audio using that 700 Hertz cutoff, we're able to create a sound which is amplified um, to produce a better hammer strike result. So I'm using uh, this audio analysis code where I take, I strip the audio files and I create a low pass frequency equation, which is the square root of the um, frequency squared divided by the frequency ratio which is then printed into a numerical area of n. Um, as I explained in the demo, I then run this through a mean function where I basically create a mean of all, the, all of the values within the area and throw them into a filtered um, variable, which is then created into a WAV file. This is then, um, then using the previous code that we had created to calculate the crest factor and standard deviation values. I throw that into that calculation, which then gives us a pass or fail um, depending on whether it is not filtered or filtered. So in the image below, I show you what it, it originally gave us before we filtered the audio with the jumbled up noise. And as you can see, the RMS is a lot better with the filtered value with a lower standard deviation and a higher crest factor, which is considered to be passing based off of the sound that we get from the hammer test. So now I'm going to play the audio um, or the video uh, of the demo that I created. All right, so for my portion of the demo, what I'm going to be demonstrating for you today is a filtration system that we are going to be using for the hammer test subsystem 
of our project. So previously I had been working on some code in Python that would allow us to calculate the pass or fail based off of a the audio sample that we record from the hammer test. But we ran into some issues where the gearbox was really loud compared to that hammer test. So what I'm doing here, I have Audacity opened and I have a audio sample of a hammer test. Now this audio sample, I'm going to do with it is I'm going to use a low pass filter as a demonstration to filter out the gear noise and then amplify that gear noise, or I'm sorry, amplify the hammer strike noise in order to gain an accurate test value of a pass or fail. So this is the audio sample that we're using. It's just a hit that we previously gathered. <laughs> So you can see that the audio of the gearbox is a lot louder than that hammer test. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add a low pass filter to this. Um, let me select this first. We're going to go ahead and add a low pass filter to this value. I'm going to select the whole audio sample for um, to demonstrate how it would actually be with the Python code. I'm going to go ahead and add a frequency of 700 hertz. This is from what Maya have tested to be the best value for the cutoff frequency alongside anywhere from 24 to 48 decibels. I've noticed that 24 decibels is the best range so far for the roll off. So we go ahead and use that. Um, and we're going to notice that the gearbox noise has diminished compared to the hammer strike noise. You can still hear both of them. And I'm also going to demonstrate what it sounds like with 48 with 48 decibels. It you you're going to kind of get the same thing um, but the hammer strike might be a little bit sharper so what we're gonna end up doing now is that obviously it's still not loud enough so we're gonna go ahead and amplify the audio sample um, using the max amplification that we can for this audio sample we're gonna see that the amplification for the hammer strike increases by a lot compared to the gear noise so if I play this again you're going to see that the gear noise is now much quieter than the sound of the hammer strike. So with testing, I'm going to see if I can still get the gear noise to decrease a little bit um, just because the hammer strike noise is going to be amplified no matter what since it is uh, um, a higher frequency than the current cutoff. So this is important because for our Python code, which I'm going to show you now, I'm using that um, that example in order to create the code that I'm using now in order to create a low pass filter using the code that we have previously created in the previous video. So what I'm doing here is I am taking a file. Um, I'm using a the hit sample that I just showed you and I'm putting that into a file name and I'm creating some samples for the I'm getting sample frames and I'm putting the audio file into a numerical array. Um, this area is then using a mathematical function in order to calculate the standard deviation and then crest value, which is what we are using to determine whether or not the hammer strike is a pass or fail. Once I'm going to be using this for the unfiltered and then I'm comparing it to the filtration um, the, or the filtered audio um, using a similar code. So what I created here was I am stripping the audio file above um, that I just showed you all and I'm taking the values and throwing them again into a numerical array. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking the current cutoff frequency which I have currently set to 900 and I am going to create a numerical equation which is used to um, calculate the low pass frequency. Um, that frequency is going to be is going to be using the value of n right here, and that equation is taking the square root of frequency squared divided by that fre same frequency ratio. That value is then going to be entered into the running mean, which is going to get the mean for all of the values within the numerical array, um, and creating some cumulative sum of said array, and then creating a average off of that sum. That is going to help us create a more accurate filtration value, which is then entered into the filtered value that we see here. Um, that is then turned into that, then that filtered value, that filtered array is turned back into an audio file, which we then use to test again using that same crest factor equation that we use for the unfiltered value. Um, what that is going to do again is take the um, numerical value that we have from the audio file and find the crest factor and the determine whether it's a pass or fail. So if I run this for you, what you're going to see is that we had a audio sample that had a 20 
um, value crest factor, which is considered a fail, a fail. But that is only because of the gear sound. But whenever we are able to filter out a majority of that gear sound, we are then gaining a crest factor rating of 25. Now, the only issue with the current codes that I have is that it is not finished. Um, currently, this is only the low pass filtration. So um, if you remember in the Audacity example that I showed you, the low pass really strips the audio from everything. So you're not really able to hear the hammer strike as loudly as you do after you amplify it. So what I'm going to work on in the next week is creating an amplification system after, um, after filtering the value in order to amplify the sound to get a better and more accurate reading of the crest factor. So the last thing that I'm going to share is um, with the last thing I'm going to share is my GAN chart. Um, so this is my current GAN chart. I just show all of the main milestone things that I have accomplished. Um, the main thing to talk about is that crest factor code along with the the motor code, which I'm not showing here because I know that the others are going to be the others are, have taken care of that. Um, I began an initial SQL database design with Ryan, which Ryan has then taken over due to my need of having to take care of the low pass filtration system. Um, but after I'm done with this um, low pass filter, I'm going to go ahead and ensure that the database functions as necessary, along with finalizing any any structure or hammer tests, any bugs, anything that needs to be worked on. Um, after the filtration system is done, mo the majority of my and my part of the project is finished, and I'm just going to make sure that anybody needs any other help, I go ahead and help them and fix any issues that my current stuff has after we do testing. Now I'm going to talk about the system use case that we currently have within our project um, of Rupik. Um, the way that it's going to work is we have a technician who is going to be on site with the wooden pole. Uh, they are going to first attach the wooden pole, or I'm sorry, they're going to attach the collar to the wooden pole. That wooden pole, he is then, or he or she is then going to log into the collar app, which Ryan has created, in order to operate the pole collar. Um, once he begins operating the pole collar to where he or she needs it to go, um, and they're going to collect the necessary sensory data and hammer test information. That information is then going to go into our database, which we previously were going to use AWS, but saw that it was too expensive, um, especially since we are currently just doing a bit of testing on the low end. That information is then going to be displayed on the app as the poll report. Now, poll report is going to display what the values are that we got and whether or not that has a pass or fail. Um, after the initial testing, obviously the this 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 routine this use case is going to be repeated over and over and over again until the technician is done with his or her evaluation. So that um, comes to the end of our project um, our project presentation. Thank you so much for listening.